It's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, my very good colleague and friend, Ben Shapiro. Uh, ben needs no introduction to many of you, uh, but I think a brief uh, sort of a background will help to those who don't know him. Uh, ben joined us in 2000. Uh, 2000, 2000, yeah. 2000, right, from Caltech, right after when he finished his PhD. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had a privilege to know him all these years. And uh, I would say probably the best way to describe Ben, and I'm not even going through the bio, is uh, it's fair to say that Ben is one of the very first people who uh, established the link between the field of control and the field of micro nanosystems. And, and I think this has been tremendously important, and it was obviously recognized by National Science Foundation uh, because he, um, I think, put together a workshop mm -hmm. on this topic 2004, years back. Yep. And, and, and even to this day, he, his work is used as one of the models uh, for many of us in the micro nanosystems who need to take advantage of all these great resources that are available in the field of control theory and beyond. So today, he's going to give us a sort of an overview about some of the exciting research that he does in his group. So with no further ado, Ben. Well, thank you so much. And, and, and it's, it's a real, real pleasure to, to, to speak at ISR. I, I, I think ISR is, um, combines systems and control with, with cool stuff. And, and, and I hope to show you that, that some of this these things are, are, are kind of neat. And, and so actually, for those of you who do know a little bit what I do, um, we started out as doing control of, of microfluidics, control of chips, uh, control of particles and chips. And after a while, we, after we sort of had some idea of what to do uh, about controlling cells and, and, and quantum dots and things on chip, we're like, well, what else could we do? You know, wouldn't it be fun to control particles in people? So that, that was sort of the, the, the rough beginning of this. Wouldn't it be fun to control particles in people? And so we uh, got in touch with a clinician who had done the first clinical trials for magnetic drug targeting. And, and that's how this started. So it sort of started from our naive, like, wouldn't it be fun to control things inside patients? Uh, and, then, and then it led to this stuff. So, so let me give you um, sort of an overview of, of, of what we're doing. Um, so, so let me just start out with what magnetic drug targeting is. Uh, so, so, so magnetic drug targeting is where you use uh, magnetic fields to focus therapy to specific locations in the body. And, and so the simplest example uh, looks something like this. You have a patient. Uh, you systemically inject that patient with magnetic nanoparticles. And then those things circulate through the bloodstream. And then you hold a magnet. And the magnet collects the particles to a location in the body. And therefore, you can focus your therapy to, let's say, uh, a surface tumor in the patient. So this is the simplest example of what magnetic drug targeting is. Um, magnets are a good idea uh, compared to, for example, electric fields or optical fields or ultrasound uh, for, for, for the reason that they're safe and deep. So electric fields can electrocute patients, and, and optical fields and uh, sound have limited penetration depths. But magnetic fields, it's OK to be to put a actually very large field through through people, and we do it all the time in MRI imaging. So, so, so magnetic targeting has this ability to use fields that we know are safe for patients to be able to manipulate uh, magnetic, magnetic carriers. And, and, and the carriers that people use are most simply magnetic nanoparticles. So you take magnetic nanoparticles, which are usually starch particles with, with iron cores inside them, and then you coat them with something that makes the particle uh, biocompatible, and then you attach drugs to that coating, and that's the simplest thing that people like to to steer around inside patients. But they can also be other interesting things. Um, so they can be um, polymer capsules that you load with, magnet with drugs and magnetic material inside them. They can be micelles. They can be liposomes. And people even do things where they take, for example, stem cells, and then they grow them in a cell culture medium that is full of magnetic nanoparticles. And then the stem cells eat the magnetic nanoparticles. So now you have stem cells with magnetic nanoparticles inside them, and so you can steer stem cells around the body. And so people are doing that for things like uh, diabetic wounds, where you'd like to be able to uh, drive stem cells to where you want wound repair or you want to fix blood vessels and things like that. So there's a lot of different things that, 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 that you can steer around. And, and I think one point I would like to sort of make as we start is, you know, when I go to these magnetic drug targeting conferences, it's, it's the people who started the field that are there, right? So, so, so it's nanofabricators. It's chemists, 
it's clinicians, it's magnetics people, but I'm the only controls person there, uh, or pretty much, right? But this is really a controls problem. It's a, a, at this stage, it has reached a controls problem. It's, it's a problem of how do I manipulate magnets to, to put the right particles at the right places, right? So, so I, I sort of want to keep that in the back of our heads that really this is be, be becoming a controls problem. And so the kind of things that people worry about from a biological point of view is, is the first thing you, you worry about is you worry about uh, designing the particles and the magnetic fields in such a way that the particles don't agglomerate. If the particles clump together, then they can uh, block blood vessels and you can kill animals. And also, you know, you definitely would not put such particles in a patient. So you can kill animals by having particles agglomerate. So the particles are designed with sufficient coatings so that they don't uh, bind to each other too strongly. Um, and then the second thing that you want is um, you want a good residence time. You want the particles to survive in the body long enough so that they can, can have therapeutic effect. So, you know, your body, your immune system is designed to take things out. And, and, and if the particles have a two-minute half-life in your body, then that's not very useful from, from a drug, drug delivery standpoint. Yes? So how important is the shape of these particles and the uniformity of these particles, especially when you do batch processing? Uh, so those are two great and two different questions. Um, so so, so the, the batch processing, People spend a lot of time and effort in, in, in trying to make what is called monodispersed mono particles. Uh, definitely, if you, you are going to go to the FDA, uh, they will want to know that your particles are within, within some spec. Uh, and people are getting good at that. Um, so, so, so and, you know, and, and they're still polydispersed to some degree, but people are getting good at making, at making monodispersed particles. In terms of shape, shape is fantastic. And, and, and it's something that is only just beginning to be thought about. Um, so, for example, if you make, uh, I'll show you in a second that forces vary with volume. So if you make your particles sort of long, then you might have big forces but be able to snake them through stuff. And then it also turns out that rigidity is an issue. So like long spikes are very bad because the macrophages can't, can't eat them and then you basically take the immune system into shock. Right, so the immune system attacks these particles, it's not working, so it attacks it some more, it's still not working, and then you go into shock. Um, but then if, you, if they're flexible, th th then it can be beneficial. Um, so th th that's one of the big open questions right now. So, so most, and, and there's another sort of part to this, which is that, you know, maybe there's like 150 groups that make nanoparticles, of which 70 groups have tried them in cell cultures, of which 15 groups have tried them in animal models, of which Two groups have tried them in, 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 in patient clinical trials. So there's this big funnel of sort of basic research to animal models to, to. So, so, you know, particles that are good for human use are, there's not that many of them available. So that's, that's the other big thing. All right, so here's the basic of, of, of how magnetic forces uh, scale on particles. So magnet, magnetic forces go with volume. If I make my particle 10 times as big, I will exert 1,000 times more force for the same magnetic field. Um, the magnetic forces fall off quickly with distance away from magnets, whether I use electromagnets or permanent magnets. Um, forces and magnetic fields fall off quickly, roughly as 1 to the x to the 7th for either electromagnets or permanent magnets for the force. So what that means is that it's difficult to get sufficient force deep in the body. So that's a challenge. Um, the magnetic fields that people use are, can be large. So MRIs, um, safety standards for MRIs are up to 8 Tesla for adults, uh, up to 4 Tesla for kids. So just as a point of reference, the thing that picks up cars in junkyards is 2 Tesla. So these are big, big, strong magnetic fields. Um, and then there's also a rate limit on uh, how quickly you change the magnetic field per second because that sets up eddy currents in a patient. And so there's a limit on how quickly you're allowed to do that. And um, this is the current state of the art. Uh, the current state of the art is that uh, these particles have been tried in animals and in patients. So, th th so this is a uh, photograph from a human clinical trial done in Germany in 1996. Uh, this patient had an inoperable uh, solid uh, cheek tumor. And uh, what was done was exactly uh, what um, I showed you a slide ago. He was given systemic nanoparticles uh, he was given nanoparticles systemically. They were coated with epirubicin. And then a 0.8 Tesla magnet was held next to the tumor and collected the particles. And this was, um, this, uh, these were advanced cancer patients so that the, they, they could get permission to do the, the trials. And so this was for what's called um, relief. It wasn't to cure the patient. It was to provide relief from pain and injury of the tumor. 
All right, so, 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 so this is where we are. And, and, and roughly, uh, my talk can basically be summarized as this. We want to do better than, than, than sort of a magnet on the stick. We want to begin to understand how to design magnets and when to put the magnets, how to turn them on and off to be able to put the particles where we want them to go. OK, so what I just that's a That is a very strong magnet. Really small, strong magnet, right? Yeah. It's, so so I'll, I'll show you a photograph later where we have um, two of those magnets interacting. Um, it, it'll, it'll be fun. Uh, no, they're strong magnets. They're strong magnets. And, and actually, the particle size is also, so, so, so from, the, from, from the force point of view, you want to make the particles as big as possible. But from the clearance point of view, the bigger you make the particles, the quicker the immune system picks them up. So, so there's, a, there's a maximum size. And also, you want to have the particles, in most situations, be small enough so they can go from the blood vessels into surrounding tissue, right? So the sweet spot winds up being about 500 nanometers, 300 nanometers, something like that. If you make them microns, they can't get out of the blood vessels. If you make them 50 nanometers, you don't get enough force. This is sort of the sweet spot. That, you know, so most people are making particles in the you know, 50 to 350 nanometer range, something like that. All right, so, 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 so here's what I'd like to do. Uh, so, so we have a lot of stuff going on. Uh, what, what I want to do is I want to show you three examples. And, and, and I've picked three examples from the sort of simplest control, where the control is, 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 is very easy, but we are far along. Um, and that's the ear stuff that I'm going to show you first. All the way out to where the control is more sophisticated, but we haven't even got to animal experiments yet. And then something in between that's based on autopsy studies. So I want to sort of give you a sampling of, you know, sort of those three projects increased in, in control complexity from the top left to the bottom right, but they decrease in their maturity. So the one on the left, top left is more mature, and the one on the bottom right is, 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 is least mature. And, and one of the points here is that even fairly simple control control, even fairly simple magnet design can already begin to do, begin to do interesting things. And so these are the three projects I'm going to talk about. Um, and before I do that, let me just go a little bit over the physics of, of magnetic particles, which is the following. So the, the forces on a, on a magnetic particle go from low to high applied magnetic field. So, so basically, the force goes as uh, the gradient of the magnetic field squared. right? And, and, and so you, you can derive this. Um, so it goes from low to high magnetic field, which is really all that you need to remember for the control stuff later on is that magnetic particles like to go from low to high magnetic field strength. Right? Uh, and you can derive this um, as follows. Uh, you can note that uh, the energy of a magnetic particle has one component because the particle gets magnetized. That's like the displacement, the, 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 the displacement of the magnetic charges in the particle. And it has a second component due to the force that you apply to it, which is the, the magnetic field. And so the energy of a particle goes as the magnetic field squared. And so the force is the derivative of the energy, so it's the grad gradient of the magnetic field squared. Right? So forces on particles go up the gradient of the magnetic, magnetic field squared. What that means is that if you um, take a magnet, uh, particles will go to the magnet corners, just like iron filings will go to magnet corners. And if you flip the magnet, if you change the polarity of the magnetic field, it doesn't change, doesn't change the force. Right? So, and really, that's pretty much all we'll need to know in terms of like, um, describing the, the, the next couple of projects. And, and, if the, and if your magnetic field is strong enough to saturate the particle, that doesn't change stuff either. All right, so let me, let me start out with this project. Um, so, so the project is how do you better treat inner ear ailments? And so the inner ear, just like the brain and the eyes, is behind the blood-brain barrier. What that means is that if you have a vessel that is, let's say, in my arm or my neck or somewhere else other than my brain or my inner ear or my eyes, uh, those vessels have pores. The, 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 their vessel boundaries are, have pores in them. And so if I take an aspirin or if I take some kind of drug, there's enough space I, I, in the boundary of my blood vessels for those drug molecules to elute out from the blood into the surrounding tissue. In the brain, the environment is very, very tightly protected. Pretty much the only thing that can get into your brain is glucose, which is a tiny molecule. And that's controlled how it gets in there. So in the brain, drugs don't go from blood vessels out. So if, if, if I take a pill or if I get systemic injection, then there'll, there'll be the drug in the blood vessels in my brain, but those drugs will not make it out into my brain, and they will not make it out into my inner ear. So there's a variety of inner ear ailments 
um, sudden hearing loss, tinnitus, Meniere's disease, and, and these affect, I mean, tinnitus affects one in 10 people in the United States. Um, and, and sudden hearing loss is, is, is big too. Um, there's a variety of inner ear diseases where it's thought that you have the right kind of drugs, for example, steroids, it's just that you can't get the drug into the inner ear, right? And so the project is, how do you go ahead and start getting drugs, dr drugs into the inner ear? And so the, the, the answer is the following. Um, so it's a unpleasant but standard treatment to inject through the eardrum. So my brother had this when he was a kid. Um, if you have a middle ear infection, they can punch a hole in your eardrum to, uh, to let the fluid out. Um, you actually inject right underneath the eardrum so through a flaccid part. So it's, and, and even when you put catheters in the eardrum, so long as you don't hit the center of the eardrum, the eardrum grows back out from the center, it'll heal. So it's a standard but somewhat unpleasant treatment to inject um, through the eardrum. And so the treatment is the following. We would inject a gel or a solution filled with magnetic nanoparticles. And then we would use a nifty little magnetic device to magnetically push the nanoparticles from the middle ear through the round window membrane into the inner ear. And that would deliver therapy directly into the inner ear without having to do systemic, systemic administration. Um, you could ask, why can't you just go, uh, so, so, so you could not inject the syringe into the round window membrane, both because it's not accessible, there's no line of sight to the round window membrane from the outside, and also the round window mem membrane is so delicate that if you were to puncture it with a syringe, you would destroy it. Right? So there's no way to get the syringe to go both through the middle ear and the round window membrane. And this Boingo stuff is annoying. Um, all right, so, so I told you earlier that, 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 that magnets uh, attract, uh, attract particles, so you know, let, how would you make a, a, a magnetic injector system that would push particles? So you, you can do a very simple thing, um, and so let me just describe the, the simple thing. Um, it's just an unstable node, so that, that's what you do. So if you, make a, if you have a regular magnet, uh, these are the magnetic uh, field lines around the regular magnet, just like we're used to from, from high, school, high school physics. Um, if I take two magnets and I tilt one down and the other one up and I flip the second one, then I can pick a point where the magnetic field is purely horizontal to the right in the top magnet and is purely horizontal to the left in the, sec in, in the bottom magnet. And if I overlay these two magnets, the magnetic fields add up. Um, these lines are just guides. They're no longer magnetic field lines. But right here, where the magnetic fields add, these two fields cancel. And so I get, a, I get a zero magnetic field over here. And then around it, they don't cancel, and I don't get a zero magnetic field. And so what I get is I get an increasing magnetic field from here outwards and from here inwards. And if I can position this point so that it's behind my gel of nanoparticles, then I will be applying a force through the gel of nanoparticles into the round window membrane. And so that's exactly what we did. Um, so here's, you know, solutions of Maxwell's equations. Uh, this is what the magnetic field actually looks like. So this time I'm drawing the magnetic field lines over here. Uh, this is a plot showing the resulting magnetic force, and there's these two nodes. And they, they're basically two unstable nodes. There's one here in front of the magnets, and there's one here uh, inside them. And the forces go out from, 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 from the magnetic field minimum. And just to show you how this works in the lab, um, this is a little matchbox uh, magnet. It's strong. It's a one Tesla magnet. It's about this size. Um, and this is um, a little steel bead in a, a capsule. And it just snaps it out of the fingers. So I'll just run that again. And then here's, the, um, here's our setup. We're actually, at the beginning, we use this node over here. Same capsule, st same steel ball. And then as Azim picks it up, then you can see right there you get the magnetic push force on the particle. Okay. And so we've used this in animal experiments with Didier de Perot in ISR. Um, and uh, so here's the little rat um, looking, looking up at the magnet. There's a little uh, uh, piece of uh, paper in there showing where his, um, the alignment through his round window membrane. Um, this is where the magnetic force is. And then after we did the experiment, we took a scrape from the inside of the ear from the cochlea. Uh, the particles are marked fluorescent red. And so this is a... Um, this is a scrape where uh, the C panel is a scrape where we had no magnetic push applied. And then the D panel is a scrape where we did magnetic push and we see a, a bunch of magnetic nanoparticles inside, inside, the ear of the, of, inside the inner ear of the rat. 
Um, so yeah, so, so at, at, at this point, we're sort of at the stage of um, successful animal experiments. Um, the next thing that, we're, that we have done already, we have experiments for, is increasing that distance from the two centimeters you see for the rat to, in a human, the distance from the magnets to around the membrane is about three to five centimeters, depending on the size of your head. Um, so we, we, are designing, we have designed magnets to do that. Here's how we design, um, yes? Basically fluid. It's basically fluid. And, and, uh, and, and the fluid resistance is also part of the picture, and it slows it down. And yeah. So 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 um, the fluid resistance is is minimal compared to, to to the tissue resistance that we have to go through. So we have to go through a round with the membrane. It's about three cells thick. So it's about 20 microns, 40 microns thick, um, and about you know two millimeters wide. Uh, the, the, so, so your ear has two membranes. Um, your, your, your eardrum separates the outer ear from the middle ear. And then there's a tiny little round with the membrane that separates the middle ear from the inner ear. So we push through the round with the membrane. Uh, it's about 40 microns thick. Um, and that's the thing we really have to get through. The, the fluid is, offers little resistance in comparison. We push for about half an hour so for the experiments we did. Uh huh. Uh, so, 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 so that's that's a great question. One of one of the other things we want to be able to do is um, be able to push through, for example, skin to reach skin ailments. Well, that's an obvious market. Um, skin is much much harder. Um, skin skin is designed to to prevent things going from it. Um, so, in terms. In terms of the magnetic forces that we apply, I know exactly how much magnetic force we apply, and I can exactly optimize the magnetic force. I know exactly what I can do in terms of the magnetic forces, because it's just the gradient of the magnetic field squared. So I can do that exactly. The part that starts becoming um, open is what is the best choice of, of nanoparticle. So for example, um, size becomes a big issue, and coding becomes a big issue. So coding is easy to understand. if, if, if you and we're able to coat the particle with some kind, some kind of thing that was slippery to tissue, then you might be able to get it in better. So that's a, that's a surface chemistry question. That's an open question. Uh, the other thing is size. Um, so you're trying to get it through tissue. Um, as, as I make the particle bigger, I win in terms of force with radius cubed. But for tissue resistance, the um, resistance to particle motion it's, first of all, it's much more complicated. Nobody's measured it for the round the mirror, for example. But for the things that people have measured for, it looks something like this. It's kind of flattish up until you hit some critical size, and then it hits a wall. So for example, it's porous, and then it hits a wall, right? So the sweet spot is to sort of be as big as you can be, but less than the pore size that you're trying to get through, something like that. We tried getting through skin, even with monstrously big magnets. And skin is just designed to keep stuff out. So we were not able to get through healthy skin. We were able to get into compromised skin, which would be good for things like bed sores, ulcers, things like that. So, so, so I think the difficulty, is, is the difficulty in the science now is in the nanoparticle design for that issue. So I think that's but a fair. people don't quite know what the fundamental limits might be at this stage? No. So, 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 so people haven't done the... Yeah, that's open. Um, and, and, and people, you know, it, it, it's different groups, right? So, 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 you know, when you go talk to the nanoparticle chemistry and, and, and chemistry folks, they have never gone in and measured the migration coefficient of a nanoparticle through. That, that's not the kind of thing they do, right? And, and, and so now there's this integration beginning to happen where we're like, all right, you know, how do we take these tissue samples? How do we measure nanoparticles concentrations? How do we start measuring, you know, how do we start doing system identification on tissue? Basically, so so yeah, so that, that that's definitely an open question. Yeah, I mean that's definitely an open. The, uh, that, 
yes, uh, people have studied that, but not to, if, if, I, if I go to a person that makes, um, that functionalizes surfaces, and I go, which functionalization should I choose to best wend my way through liver tissue? The answer to that question is unknown. So, so it's true that people functionalize chemistry, and it's true that people are very good at design, but, but, but the question of which chemistry should I pick to best move through type X tissue, that question is open. No, but in this case, we are going through tissue. In this case, we're going through the round with the membrane. So, so it. So, so John, it, it, it depends on the clinical need you're trying to address. If, if the clinical, and I'll talk about this in a second. If the clinical need is, how do I reach liver metastases? Then yes, I'm trying to go from blood vessels into liver metastases. But if the clinical need is, I want to be able to locally reach the inner ear because I cannot access it systemically, then in this case, we're going through tissue. And if I want to go into skin, I'm definitely going through tissue. I'm going through skin. So if I wanted you know, to treat, um, uh, let's say I wanted to treat bed sores or ulcers, and I want to be able to put a gel on a patient's skin and then drive it into the bed sore ulcer, I have to go through the skin. So it depends, it depends, what, it depends what clinical need you're addressing. So, all right. So, 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 so yes? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, no worries. Uh -huh. What effect does that have on the kind of area that you're sampling or the... Let me... <laughs> no, it's okay, it's okay. So, so, so I'll, I'll, try to, I'll try to do some balance between... I can answer that now or let's leave that towards the end of the talk. So I'll, so I'll, 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 I'll pick. But, but, but okay, so, so, so you could phrase an optimization question that asks, what is the optimal way to design a magnet array to be able to maximize my forces, right? And so... This is one slide that shows how we do this, right? So, so, so the question is the following. Suppose I give you a Halbach array. So, so here's an array. Where's my thing? So here's an array of magnets. And I ask the question of which direction should I magnetize each, ma magnetize each block, which is exactly what you just asked, right? So, so I, have some, I have some array. I want to magnetize each, each, each one. So I can solve this question as follows. Um, I know the magnetic field for, I, just analytically, I can write down the magnetic field for uh, straight magnetization on a block, either horizontal or vertical, right? So now, if I have it at some angle, everything superposes. So I can write down the magnetic field as cosine alpha A plus, co plus sine alpha B, right? So I can, I can write it down that way, right? So now I know the magnetic field for an angle, and I can superpose across all the different arrays to get the magnetic field everywhere. Once I get the magnetic field everywhere, I form the gradient of the magnetic field squared, and that gives me, gives me my force. So the punchline is I can write down a quadratic mapping from the coefficients of the strength along x and y of each magnet to the resulting magnetic force. So I, I get something that looks like Q transpose PQ. And then I have some constraints. You know, Don't make my, my, my magnet stronger than 2 Tesla or whatever. Right? So we can optimize that P matrix by just using semi-definite programming. And, and, and it turns out for this case, when you do the semi, you, you, your up and lower bounds converge. And so we get a global optimum. So we know what the global optimum is for designing a Halbach array. And so we can just say the globally optimal magnet design is this thing. And so that's what we're doing. And, and, and so when we're asking, like, what is the best force that we can create at five centimeters, we globally optimally design a Halbach array with whatever many magnets, however big, and then we know that that magnet array is, 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 is the best thing. The, the, the assumption here is Maxwell's equations, and that the um, and that I'm varying, um, and that once I fix the little arrow magnetization of that magnet, it's fixed. So so basically, I, I go to a company and I ask them to give me 20 blocks, each with a certain arrow, and then I glue them together. Right now, just for this first problem, this is permanent static magnets. Yeah. We will talk about time variation in a second. Yeah, we could do time variation as well. Yes. Also, your criterion is that there is a single point when you want a vector. Mm -hmm. So do you consider the fact that the vector field could be changed by both? 
Yes, yes. So, 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 so that's sort of the next level. A, 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 actually, the level before that is even more important is just robustness. I'm going to have some errors in my magnetization. So, 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 so yeah, and, 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 and we, we, I don't have a global optimum for the robust solution yet, but you can already start doing max min type of stuff. Um, the answers you get are pretty, uh, let me just show you the next slide. Uh, th these are the kind of, so these are the kind of answers you get, right? So, 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 so this is an optimal two by nine array to maximize the force at this point. And this is just what it looks like. This is, and you, you kind of see this sort of like, actually this one's creating a node, this one's creating a push. But if I did an op optimal pull, the, the optimal answer is usually a fan. And you can also optimize the shape. The way we optimize the shape is we take a big grid, we do let's say a 20 by 20 by 20 grid, we optimize the whole thing, and then we look at which ones got magnetized the highest, and we throw away the other ones. And the, optimal, and, and the optimal shapes that you get are basically half basketballs. So if I, if, if, if I want to put a force at this point, I, wanna, I want my magnets as close as possible to that point as possible. So, so you can do both. So you know, this, th this is the optimization. Um, this is how we do it. This is, this is a Halbach array with four magnets. Um, so this is a 1.48 Tesla array that we had built for us. Um, so I want to show you this little photo. So um, this thing, uh, this work? All right, so this thing is about the size of one of those little plates back there. It's about this big. And then at one point, um, my students were working with the other magnet, which is the size of two matchboxes, and they brought them within, you know, maybe about that far of each other, and the two magnets snapped together. And so, th so this is a photograph of one, two, three. This is four, it took four people two hours to separate these magnets apart. And the way they did it is they slowly wedged in plexiglass underneath it. And, 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 and. So these, these are no joke, you know? Like, thank God, like, the guy's finger wasn't, like, between the two magnets. But, sorry? These are, perma these are permanent magnets. We, I'll show, because we don't need them for this situation. For this situation. But, but, but. but but John, I'll have cooling and I'll have cost, right? You know, it's it, 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 it's a good question. We're actually st we're actually starting to commercialize the uh, magnetic push for the ear, and. We could sell a system to doctors that they could magnetically inject in it, that would be packaged, right? So, so long as they don't have another magnet in the office, we could just sell to them. We could make one for them, we could sell them for 20 bucks, right? If I wanted to make the same thing electromagnetically uh, with, you know, one Tesla, I'd probably have to pay a couple of thousand bucks, right? Because I need cooling, big. So right now we're doing, um, we're doing uh, handheld permanent magnets. But we're having the same discussion with our doctor who's, it's exactly what you guys said. It's, if you turn it off, you know, it's safety versus cost. That's what it is. MRIs cost in the millions of dollars and MRIs are about the same magnetic. Okay, so, 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 so somewhere between a thousand and a million is the, is the, is the correct price. So. So, so just to follow on your uh -huh. remark about the potential for marketing this product, uh -huh. what materials, uh, near ion, boron? Yeah, or, okay. yeah, yeah. And, and so the question always is really where is the availability? Is the yeah, so we worry about China, but yeah, 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 we worry about China, but actually we worry about China a lot. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I mean, I know that I can do, I, I know how to solve this problem with electromagnets. No, no, no question, right? I, I could, absolutely. So you can have more control. So the last, the last slide I'm going to show you on this one is just uh, comparing uh, push versus pull. Um, so when we first started, um, uh, the, the doctors from, from Oklahoma, they were doing pull through the, so in a, in a person, if you pulled, you would have to do it through the entire width of the head, whereas if you pushed, you only have to do it through three or five centimeters. So the punchline is, uh, push wins over pull by a lot. We win by a factor of 20. Uh, and, and so you can do uh, safe magnetic, you can do magnetic fields that are below FDA safety standards, whereas if you did it over here to get the same force that we need, 
you would exceed FDA safety standards. But you say, but yes. Harsh, being a out outcome of instability, uh -huh. there's always a question of what is the uh, rate of travel of the particle through the surrounding material uh -huh. safe, right, under the push conditions. So, I mean, how, how do we know that physics as well I mean, in, 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 in these kinds of settings? I mean, just to know that the particle would not go, I mean, in your demo, for instance, yeah, yeah. you showed the, the little, little sphere shoots up, okay? The rate of movement under push conditions uh -huh. has to be somehow within limits in order to avoid, avoid tears and other side damage. So, I mean, do we, do we know that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I know that, I, I know that completely because I know I, I, I know what magnetic field I create. Once I know what magnetic field I create, I know what forces I create. So I, I can completely predict in both. In the surrounding medium, so that's, that's the issue. Right? In the surrounding medium. Well, the, surra the surrounding medium is going to provide resistant forces to. And it's to, only fluid. So, so I, I actually have, Didier gave it to me. I, I actually have sort of a cutaway. Um, piece of ear sitting on my desk so you can come look at it. Um, but there's, there's, first of all, it's tiny. But there's, this, there's a space, and you're in, the, in, you're in the middle ear. And then there is this tiny little round with the membrane, and it's bone around that, right? And so there's only, there's only one place. In this situation, there's only one place where these things are going, and that's through the round with the membrane. And that's, and that's what we see in the animals, right? So after we do the experiments, Didi does surgeries and we do histologies. We, we, we have this fancy uh, setup where we take, you know, we take the whole thing and we just slice, photograph, slice, photograph, slice, and so we know where all the nanoparticles went. And they just, they wind up in the inner ear. And, that, and that's the only place they wind up. Yeah. Yes? Uh-huh. Uh huh. They're all going to be going in the right direction. Whereas with your push, most of them are actually going at an angle. And so the component of force in the direction you want is smaller. So this isn't, to me, this isn't the, 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 the comparison you want to make. We, we, um, we, align, we align the push. So, 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 so first of all, the distance over which you're doing push on this scale it's tiny, right? So, 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 so I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just show you, right? Let me just go back to this. So where's? All right. So that th that's what the forces actually look like. That's what they actually look like, right? So, so on this scale, the round window membrane is from here to there. So you know, as far as the round window membrane is concerned, this green box is uniform, right? Uh, and then, you know, for the other one, it's uniform too, right? And we align the, we align the thing in such a way that it's aimed perpendicular through a round of the membrane. And, and, and then as you age, your round of the membrane tilts a little bit. And, and so you can play those games. You, we, we can ask the game if we want it at this whatever angle. So you're the magnitude where direction is very low, right? Um, you and know. Is that an issue? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's right. Guys, the experiments work. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to say it any better than that, right? Um, So I, I can answer your question in two ways. One way I can answer your question is, so first of all, this, this, this magnetic field is analytic. Right? I just know the answer for it. I, I, I can write, so it's not, it's not numerical. I can, I can just write, so I know it as smoothly as I want to know it. Uh, but I can, I can do a simulation where I put whatever droplet size we would like and, and see how it goes with, with constraints. But that's not really, that's not the question I 
care about so much. The question I really care about is, I take a rat, I inject into the middle ear, how many of the particles go through, right? And, 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 and so the real measure of success is, in the rat, how many particles went into the inner ear versus how many remained in the middle ear. And, and that's what we're doing. I, I, yeah, so I, 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 does that answer the question? What happens to the particles that they don't go through? Uh, they remain in the middle ear and they get drained by the lymphatics. They get, the they get drained by the lymphatic system. Actually, both, both in the middle ear and the inner ear, they eventually get drained by the lymphatic. We, 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 haven't, we haven't gotten that far. We haven't gotten... Right. Um, yeah, we, we haven't gotten as far as... We're at the point where we've done maybe about 20 animal experiments, and we know that they go in, and we know that the animal retains its hearing after, uh, after we've done the treatment, and we know that they get cleared. But we don't have dose response curves yet. That's next. So, so a lot of these things just now require just massive animal studies to just go through and figure out how many particles, how many went through, what's animal to, and, and, and the animal to animal variability is way higher than the magnetic field variability, than the particle, the, the, the real variability is in the animals, not in, I mean, I, I know how to design the magnetic field to have, you know, sufficiently uniform. How do they have directly They're just iron. They're just, I, they're iron cores inside a starch coating. If you put them in your ear and you use your iPhone, you will be applying a magnetic field that is 10 to the 7 times smaller than what I'm applying. So, but if you get an MRI, you worry about it. Uh, if you get an MRI, we, 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 um, the ear will start to blow. Yeah, no. <laughs> when, when, we actually check where the particles went using an MRI afterwards. And so the reason the MRI does not apply force is because the MRI applies a, unif a large uniform magnetic field and the force goes as the gradient in the magnetic field squared. So the MRI applies no forces in the particles. It doesn't move them. So we, can, so we, we use MRI afterwards to see where the particles went. That would be good. If, 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 if you could create particles that have permanent magnets, in the, either or. If, if you were able to make particles that have a, 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 a preset magnetic field in them, that would be helpful. Yeah. All right. Wow. So um, uh, let, me, um, let me switch gears to the next problem. Um, so, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, okay, I have my bar in the middle and I can't... Um, Oh my God, yeah, I gotta, gotta love Microsoft Windows. Um, okay, so, so, so I'm, I'm gonna show you two things next. So, just, just, so one thing I'm gonna show you is sweeping into micrometastases with large permanent magnets, and then I'm gonna show you dynamic control with electromagnets. So, so those are the next two things. So the, ne the next subject is still permanent magnets, but it's with, for, 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 for treating metastatic disease. And then after that, I'm going to show you control for trying to hit deep tumors. So let me, let, let, let me, motivate, um, let me motivate this bit. Um, so um, those clinical trials I showed you, that, th th those patients, magnetic drug targeting for those patients was appropriate because those patients had inoperable but shallow tumors that no longer responded to radiation therapy. Right? Inoperable, I couldn't remove them with surgery, which would have been easier, just remove the tumor. Shallow, I could just bring a magnet nearby and no longer respond to radiation therapy. So that's something like maybe, I don't know, 1.5% of patients are in that category. So it, 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 for, for those patients, it's critical, right? Because that tumor might be doing really horrible things, but it's a small fraction of patients. Metastatic disease, which is metastatic cancer, where you have thousands of tumors throughout your thousands, tens of thousands of tumors throughout your body, is the thing that kills nine out of 10 cancer patients. So I work with a guy, uh, Michael Emmert Bach, at, 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 at NCI, National Cancer Institute. And the question we started asking was, could we somehow start using magnetic forces to improve chemotherapy for metastatic disease? Would, would this be possible to do this? 
And, and the thing Mike told me then, which I'll tell you now, which is, which is kind of interesting, is that yes, if you go do animal models and the tumors grow up and the tumors get big, they will recruit blood vessels and you'll get these bloody masses, right, where these tumors recruit this vasculature. But, but, but when, Mike, when, when Michael does autopsy studies and when he does surgeries and when he sees metastatic tumors, they look they look more like this. They look like white nodules. They don't look like blood-filled massive things. They look like these small white nodules. And eventually, when some of them grow up, they eventually begin to recruit through blood vessels. But, but the majority of, this is um, liver metastases for breast cancer patient. So the majority of them look like these firm white nodules. And so the question was, if you're delivering chemotherapy into the blood and these things are not blood filled, how much chemotherapy are you getting into the tumors that you need? And could you, and, and, and is that a problem? And so basically what we did is we started doing autopsy studies to try to understand what we thought chemotherapy would have to do to get into such hypoxic metastatic tumors and whether we could improve it with, um, with magnetic fields. So, so what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you some autopsy data. Um, this is autopsy data from uh, breast cancer patients who died of breast cancer. Um, so on the left is normal tissue. So normal tissue looks like this. Um, the, the, th these guys on the left of the left are just tissue that has been stained with purple for cell nuclei, and I'm sorry, with brown for cell nuclei, and has been stained with red for blood vessels, CD31. Right? And so all the red dots, or all the red regions are blood vessels. And so this is, you know, just using MATLAB, this is what blood vessels in a normal liver look like. Right? They're sort of fairly uniformly distributed. There's a blood vessel every 100 microns. Every cell is close to a blood vessel. Every cell gets nutrient and blood supply easily. This is what it should look like. In tumor, same patients, in tumor, this is what blood vessels look like. They're further apart, they're badly shaped, and yeah, they're further apart and they're badly shaped, okay? So we had, in the meantime, created models that we had validated against experiments of chemotherapy transport and tissue. We, and we had validated them against MRI studies, we had validated against animal experiments. So we had simulations that we believed pretty good would indicate to us how chemotherapy moves from blood vessels out into surrounding tissue. And so what we did is, we took this data, we took this autopsy data from these breast cancer patients, and we just ran simulations to see where do we think the chemotherapy would go into metastatic tumors. And so that's what I want to show you. Um, so the, fir the first point is this is just some data. Um, the, this is tumor versus uh, normal uh, nuclei to vessel ratio. So there's way more nuclei per vessels in, 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 in tumor tissue than there is in normal tissue because there's a little bit more density of tumor cells but there's a way lower density of blood vessel cells in, the, in, in these metastatic, um, metastatic liver tumors. Um, and so we, we did these simulations, and, and, and what I want to show you is the idea we came up with to try to make the situation better. And, and so basically, what, I'll show you this in a second, but what the simulation showed is that if you gave a person systemic chemotherapy, since the, the, the metastatic tumors are far away from blood vessels, what you would basically get is you'd get high dosing in normal tissue, and you'd get cold spots at each of these poorly vascularized tumors because the, the chemotherapy is coming from the blood vessels. And so the idea is that if you could make the chemotherapy magnetic, and then you could apply a strong magnetic force, let's say on the left first, on the right first, actually front to back makes more sense because I'm thinner in this dimension than I am in this dimension, at least I am. So, um, so if you could apply a, a magnetic field, then you could sweep the pattern. And so you could take these cold spots and sweep them through and sweep through the liver metastasis and try to get drug delivery into the liver metastasis. And so that's basically what we started thinking about. Um, and so the simulations look like this. So this is just one sample tumor. It's representative. So it's one of the tumors from, you know, uh, from the hundreds that this patient had in, 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 in her liver. Um, and, and so you can actually look right here. Um, this is the blood vessels. The gap is where the tumor is. So this is the tumor. And what I'm going to show you is what the chemotherapy does. So this is a prediction by simulations. Um, red, red and black is high, white and yellow is low, 
It's a two-hour treatment, which is you know, consistent with the half-life of this drug. So this is what diffusion only looks like. So the, 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 the chemotherapy comes out through the blood vessels and diffuses out. And you get a cold spot that remains, um, remains at, at, the, at the tumor. And then this is what happens if you apply a magnetic left pull. So literally, I'm just holding a big magnet outside the patient. And so at some point, I bring that magnet in, and I sweep the, the, the tumor left. I sweep the, the, the therapy left. And this is what happens if I do right and left. So now I'm going to sweep right, and then I'm going to sweep left. And so if you compare, and you can compare average over time for drugs that are slow acting, or you can compare maximum over time for drugs that are fast acting, but it's basically the same thing. Um, if you do diffusion only, you get cold spots, and if you do a sweep, then you increase the uh, amount of chemotherapy in that, in, in that tumor. So basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to normalize the therapy. You're trying to take a situation where we think we have cold spots to all the liver tumors, and you're just trying to sort of smear it out so that including at the liver, you would have the same concentration that you have in the normal tissue. That's the idea. And you would be doing the same thing for all the thousands of tumors that the person has in his or her liver. Does this make, is, is there any questions about this? You know, we st so, so, so we started out very carefully, um, one at a time. Um, anytime I say anything like all to, to, a, to, a, to a cancer oncologist, they, you know, there's no all, right? People's can yeah. So, 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 so this, this is, and I'll talk about that in a second. This, this is for breast cancer patients with liver metastases. And we started with liver because there's actually uh, indications that if you could have a treat better liver, if you could treat liver metastases better, you'd be able to improve outcomes. We also did brain, bone, and muscle, but we st but we st but these simulations are for liver. Well, you know, this is a result that the way particular cancer metastasizes Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, no, no, I mean. No, ab absolutely, absolutely. All right, um, so um, let me show you uh, one last thing for this. Um, so the next thing that we're doing on this is we're beginning to do animal experiments where we would have um, animals where we would grow up tumors that are poorly vascularized and animals would grow to a tumors that are well, well vascularized. I want to show you just some kind of optimization that you can do for this. Um, and this, so Alec did this. He's, he's in the audience. Uh, actually, a bunch of my students in the audience. I'll, have to, I'll introduce them at the end. Um, so the, the question was, um, what kind of sweep is potentially best? And so you're basic, the, the balance is, is roughly the following. Um, if I just hold one magnet on one side, and I sweep for as long as possible in one direction, what I will do is I will get the particles to traverse a maximum distance. But what I will not do is I will not have particles coming into a tumor from multiple different directions. Conversely, if I hold a magnet here, and then I hold a magnet here, and then I hold a magnet here, and then I hold a magnet here, I'll bring in drugs from multiple different directions into each tumor, but I won't go a long distance along any one direction. Right? So what we did is we tried three and two directions. Turns out the third direction doesn't add much, so we just examined two directions. So we're examining two directions. We're going front and back, or left and right. We're going front and back. And then the question is, how long should I go front and how long should I go back to, on average, improve the delivery to tumors for the, this specific patient population? And so this is just a brute force optimization. Um, and, 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 and the way the coloring scheme works is the, the, the bottom axis is what percent of the time did I go to the right? So, so if I'm at this point, then that means that 60% of the time I went to the right. The top axis is what percent of the time did I go the other direction? So if, if I'm over here, I went 60% to the right, 20% of the time to the left, and the remaining 20% is the time I waited at the beginning. Right? So that's how these little plots are organized. And then they're just colored by the metric that, that, uh, that says how good the outcome is. And so you can look at this metric and just pull out, pull out the optima. So for uh, fast-acting therapies, I'm sorry, for slow-acting therapies, the optimum is about here. 
it's optimum to pull 60% 60% time in one direction and 40% of the time in the other direction doesn't matter which direction first so both stars are equally good and then for fast acting therapies you just want to go as fast you, you just want to go as far as you can as fast as possible so you just pull in one direction for as far, fast as possible and what we did is we separated the patient pool into two two classes we developed the strategy on group A and then took it and tested it on group B right and so um, below on the bottom is the histogram of what the metric looks like uh, for diffusion only versus sweep, and we're improving the outcome for group B patients based on optimization of, of group A. So this is where, so, so this is the second project. It's less further along than the ear project. We haven't gotten to animal experiments. Animal experiments are next. This is where we are in terms of this project. Any questions on this? Cool. All right. So just said that. All right, so the last thing, electromagnets, um, controlling, uh, this is the stuff that our rush is doing. Um, so controlling uh, ferrofluids to, uh, to deep targets. So this is, the the, this is the project where we haven't gotten to um, any kind of um, you know, in vivo experiments, no autopsies, no animals. We are just starting to do in vitro, we're just starting to do a bench top experiments where we're starting to do experiments in, in a Petri dish. And so the goal now is to begin to think about how to control electromagnets dynamically to be able to focus therapy to deep targets. That's the goal. And this makes sense for patients where you have an inoperable tumor deep in the body, you know where it is, but you cannot surgically remove it. So it's for that class, that class of patients. All right, um, so let me first of all show you how we control a single particle, um, so a single blob of ferrofluid. So this is our experiment. It was built by Roland Probst um, and Alec Nassif. Um, so there's a little droplet of ferrofluid in the center. We have a camera on top, and we have eight magnets, um, eight controlled electromagnets on the outside. And so this is the model. Uh, the model is that the velocity goes in the direction of the force. The force, right as before, goes in the direction of the gradient of the magnetic field squared. And so just like I did with the Halbach arrays, we can take this out and we can break it up into a, a quadratic map. So we um, use linear superposition to break this up into the sum of the voltage, the sum of the currents on each magnet times the magnetic field that that magnet produces. So we get a sum over the four magnets. I'm sorry, in the photograph there's eight magnets. So we get this thing, we break up the sum, we bring in, bring in the gradient, and if you collect terms, you can write down a quadratic map that maps from what the control, what the currents are in each electromagnet to which direction the, 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 the little droplet of ferrofluid will go next. Right? So just like before, um, we can go ahead and uh, Arash did some beautiful work in um, optimizing, um, uh, optimizing this, this, this quadratic metric, this quadratic function. And, and, and so this is what the optimal answers look like. For wherever the particle is, I can globally, optimally find the optimal um, magnet actuation to move this ferrofluid from where it is to where I want it to go next. So, so I'm just showing four examples here. These are four examples of what you should do to move the particle to the right when the particle is here, 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 and here. And they're quite different. They sort of switch. Uh, initially, the right thing to do, remember, magnets only pull, right? So initially, the right thing to do is to turn on the two magnets that are closest. And then by the time you get close to the one that can pull, then you turn on only the one that pulls, and, and that works good. And so this is what we do in real time. Uh, this, we solve this problem. And so just like we can write letters on chip, we can write now write letters magnetically. So this is an experiment. That's a droplet of ferrofluid, uh, UMD for University of Maryland. And we can write, um, write letters with, with controlled dynamic uh, electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic fields. So that's cool. That's nice. Um, other people have done that. Uh, there's, in fact, a company called Stereotaxis that does uh, surgeries in patients where they control uh, catheters with magnetic tips on them. Um, so this is, you know, it's nice. We have a very nice optimal solution. But, but we want to go the next step. Um, the next step is to be able to control a distributed ferrofluid to a target. And so I really love this. Like, I love being able to cite a theorem from 1837 while at the same time you know, working with, uh, with, with nanoparticles. So, so there's this fantastic theorem by Samuel Earnshaw. And so probably everyone in this room knows what it is, but I'll go through it anyway because it's so cool. Um, so there's this theorem. Um, so the magnetic fields are unchanged to the body. Uh, they're described by the magnetostatic portion of Maxwell equations. Here's the theorem. 
So the force on the magnetic, again, goes to the gradient of the magnetic field squared. I'm going to view this thing, the magnetic field squared, as an energy, right? So it's an energy. Um, the gradient of the energy is the force. And so what you can say is you can prove, just starting from Maxwell's equation, just starting from the top pale blue block, you can prove that the magnetic energy cannot be concave. You can't make an energy minimum. You cannot make a stable energy minimum. You can make a saddle, and you can make an unstable point like we made in the magnetic push device, but you cannot make an energy minimum. So there's no way to arrange magnets on the outside to sort of statically focus stuff to, to, to the inside, at, at least no way that we have found. right? Um, and you could, try, you could try to play tricks. You could try to do things like, well, maybe if I exploit the nonlinear magnetic saturation um, properties of particles, then I can do it. Turns out you can't. It's e you, can, you can extend Earnshaw's theorem to that case, and it still doesn't work. You can try to do things like rotating the magnetic field, and the sum, um, the sum of the Hessians is the Hessian of the sum, so that doesn't work. So basically, there's no way to arrange magnets on the outside to make, um, to make an energy, energy minimum. And so there's a cute little proof of that. Um, what you do is you form the Hessian of, of, of the magnetic energy. Uh, you use vector, uh, vector algebra to multiply it out. You get terms that appear from Maxwell's equations uh, and are zero by Maxwell's equations. Those are all the things that are crossed out. And then everything else is, is, is positive. And it has a minus sign in front of it. Um, and so just it, can't, it, it, can't, it cannot be concave. So instead, um, what we've started doing is trying to think about how to um, use feedback and, 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 and ferrofluid dynamics to be able to, at least on average, focus ferrofluid to the center. Right? And, and this is certainly true. The, the, the theorem is so simple, it's hard to bypass. All right. So, um, so in a patient, we would like to be able to focus a distributed fluid to a target. Um, so I'm going to make the classic. Uh, Mathematician joke, I'm assume your patient is a sphere. So I'm going to assume my patient is a sphere. Actually, the, the reality is, is, is way more complicated. Uh, we, have, um, we have pretty decent models um, of what happens um, for magnetic ferrofluids in, 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 in tissue. Basically, there's blood convection, diffusion, and uh, magnetic drift. Um, you have to separate what happens in the, in, in the vasculature versus what happens in the tissue. These are the kind of models we used for the autopsy stuff I showed you. I'm going to ignore all of this to start with and just focus on this term and this term and see if I can find some way of controlling electromagnets to focus ferrofluid on average. And so, okay, so that's a great question. Um, so, so there's three things that you can do. Um, the first thing that you can do is you can do, um, you can make MRI faster. So we work with a company that's trying to make MRI faster. Um, so if you, MRI scans take, you know, tens of minutes. If you could find a way to do the MRI quicker, then you could do that. And, and the way they do that quicker is they, um, they change the magnetic, the, the, the reason MRI is, is limited in bandwidth is because you can't change the eddy currents too quickly because that creates electric shocks in the patients. But it turns out that if you change the magnetic fields very, very quickly, like way faster than the cells can respond, then the cells don't have time to respond. So, so, so there's a dead zone that you want to stay out of. And so MRI manufacturers have been on the left of that zone. This company is making MRI that are on the right. So they're faster than the patient can respond. Yeah, but that's not the same as a whole body scan updated every one thirtieth of a second. Well, okay, even if I, an, an, an MRI scans, right? It, it does one scan, two scan, three scan, right? So, so, so there's a speed at which you can scan. Now you can trade off, um, you can trade off accuracy versus speed. Uh, and, and so people do do things like focus on a small region and, 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 and do it. Um, but it's not, it's not fast enough for me to, you know, let's say, do upper torso sufficiently accurately to see where my, na my, my magnetic nanoparticles are. It's, it's conceivable. Yeah, I don't. They get moved by the blood. They get moved pretty quickly. They get moved pretty quickly. Uh, the, the, the other thing that you have to do is you have to, the, the magnets I would put in would 
interrupt the MRI. So you have to duty cycle. You have to control MRI, control MRI. You can't do both at the same time. So, so, so you know, I, I mean, I, I agree with you. A, a, a MRI can be made faster, and this company we work with is making it 10 to the 4 times faster. So they're making it a lot faster. So faster is good. So that's the, that's the, first, that's the first choice. The second choice is positron, positron emission tomography. You can make your particles slightly radioactive, uh, and then you pick them up with gamma imaging. And the third choice, probably the most clever choice, is there's this new thing called magnetic particle imaging, where people exploit the nonlinear saturation properties of the particles to just sense the particles themselves. And so what you do is you put in an RF field that is big enough to get the particles to operate in a nonlinear regime, and then you look back for frequency doubling. And then when you see the frequency doubling, that's exactly where the particles are. And so that's being developed, and it's being developed by Philips. So there's, there's choices. None of them are to the point where I can just go buy a machine and do it, but there's these. Yeah. But all of these methods are aimed at locating the particles. Yeah, yeah, which is what I need. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm going to use as feedback, exactly. All right, so in terms of the control design, uh, we sort of focused on this initial qu question. The question was, you know, how do I control a single blob? How do I move a blob from, we're going to do this in two steps. Um, I, I, I can't focus the center statically, but what I can do is I can focus to the edge, for example, by turning on one magnet. And once I have the particles on the edge, I can bring them to center with minimal spreading. And then I can repeat from another direction, repeat from another direction. And then on average, what I'll create is I'll create a hot spot at the center. And so the way, we, the, the way Arash is doing that is um, you quantify the particle position is, x and y. And then you write down the covariance matrix for the, for the particle distribution. And then you minimize the trace of the covariance matrix. And so that's how we do it. And again, just like we did for the Halbach array, and just like we did for the um, single droplet control, you can form a quadratic map between these, these metrics, between the trace of the covariance matrix and the control. And once you have a quadratic map, you can optimize that map by semi-definite-like methods. And so that's, and that's, that's what we're doing. So I'll, I'll end the talk by showing you a fantastic video from, from Arash. Um, so you're looking, so this is, I, I made my quip too early. This is where the quip is assume your patient is a sphere. So assume my patient is a sphere for now. Um, there's two zoom boxes that uh, zoom in on the edges of this domain, so you can see what's happening at the edges. Uh, red and black is high. White and yellow is low. Uh, we start with a uniform concentration. And then what I'm going to do is, or what, what is being done, is uh, turn on the left magnet and focus the ferrofluid to the left, and then move it to the center with minimal spreading. Wait, turn on the right magnet, focus the right, actuate the eight magnets that are on the outside to move to minimal spreading to the center, repeat. So this is what it looks like. So you, you, you bring the, so, so you can see the, the ferrofluid got, um, came up on the left. And then in a moment, Arash is going to start actuating all eight magnets to move the, the ferrofluid bolus from the left to the center with minimal spreading. So this is as good as you can do. So it gets to the center, then he waits. Then he's going to turn on the other magnet, he's going to collect it. And then he's going to bring it back to the center. In a patient, what this would correspond to is high concentrations in some regions of the skin, high con I'm sorry, medium concentrations in some regions of the skin, high concentration at the deep tumor, but you would spare the rest of the patient's organs, immune system, and so on. So this is a big deal. If you, if you could do this in a patient, this would be a big deal. And so that's, that's, the, average, um, that's the average concentration of the ferrofluid. Like I said, medium concentration at the edges with a nice bright spot um, at the center. So let me, let, let me end with this, this chart. Um, so I showed you the control stuff we're doing, but it's being supported by all this other stuff. Um, and, and I think at this point it would be nice to introduce the students. So there's Alec is here, Barash is here. Who else is here? Uh, Arash is here. Um, anybody else? I think that's it. So there's a group of fantastic sort of six, seven people, including collaborators. And, and there's all this other stuff going on to support the things we're doing. So for example, there's the nanoparticle design, which is being done by a company in Chemisil. There's the animal experiments, which require trained surgeons to do. Uh, Didier does the ear experiments. Um, there's the autopsy studies, that required autop which required a pathologist at NCI. I have a postdoc that came up with a fantastic idea that is a salami slicer. So after we're done taking, doing our experiment, we put it in, into a cryostat. And then he takes a photo, slices off a bit of tissue, photo, slice, photo, slice, photo, slice, and it builds up a distribution of where all the particles are. 
Um, we're doing uh, experimental design, modeling with Caltech at Oscar Bruno, and we're doing control. And so it really, you really do need all these pieces to be able to, 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 to put something, something sensible together. Otherwise. So does the modeling have to do with particle interaction with uh, elastic tissue? We haven't put that in yet. So what, what modeling? The, 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 the modeling has the, it, it's the following. It's the diffusion, convection, and drift of a ferrofluid under blood flow, f uh, under blood flow and magnetic forces. That's what we've done so far. So this is still sort of meant to be for users in... Yeah, for like systemic. Yeah, exactly. 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 Good. All right, so I'll end here, and I'll take questions. All right. Yes? Can you, um, once you get a particle where you want it, can you heat it up? Yes. Oh, absolutely. So people do that. So, so, so once you put a particle in the right place, or whatever, it, once you have particles, you can uh, excite them with RF magnetic fields. You excite the hysteresis in the particle, and you can heat them up. And, and, and so people use that. Um, and, and they use it, you can use it in multiple ways. You can either use it to release stuff, like when the particle is in the right way, heat it up and get the chemicals to come off. You can do that. Uh, and then there's also... Um, um, I forgot the, the term they use for it, but there's also uh, heat therapy for cancer. And, and, and it's nuanced. You don't burn out the tumor because that does too much collateral damage. It turns out the tumors are more sensitive to heat than normal tissue. So you sensitize the tumor with the, with the particles, and then you go get, give the person radiation and chemotherapy. People do vascular surgery for, you know, things like Uh-huh. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you have a clinician we can talk to, we'd love to. Maybe the person who did your wife's surgery. Yeah. Yeah. So when you were trying to design in the last uh huh. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're starting. Uh, we're starting to look at that carefully. So, 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 so with the cryostat, we've started doing things like how do nanoparticles move through? We literally go do mouse studies and we extract organs, and then we test nanoparticle motion through liver, through kidney, through brain, through muscle, through <coughs> fat. And it's complicated. Um, f the, the, the first thing is that that cartoon, page 26 or whatever, is oversimplified because your organs are surrounded by membranes, right? And, and right, you have little sacs around your organs, right? And and and, and, and so it's hard to get through membranes because they're designed to prevent you know things going from your stomach into your, you know, lungs, or whatever. Um, so that's the first thing. And, and then you know um, the second thing is particles have preferred pathways. So in muscle, we see this very clearly. You apply a magnetic field, and they follow the striations of the muscle. And so yeah, there's all this extra. So you know, that's why I put up that first chart, is we sort of have stuff that we know how to do in animals to stuff that we're just starting to think about how to focus the distributed ferrofluid. But of course, the next thing we need to do is we need to integrate our tissue information with our models. And we need to integrate our control with you know, the fact that yeah, so we need, there's this, this humongous amount of work to do. So, yeah. But I mean, I've seen a, uh, a, a diagnostic system in the Carolinas by the city. Uh-huh. Where they do online real-time MRI. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, the laser and other things. Yep. Right. And even with sensing of the process to be able to go and hit molecules, mm -hmm. molecules of tumor, mm -hmm. and verify that you can burn just enough for a person or more. Yeah, and I agree. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. It's you know yeah it's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds awesome. That sounds fantastic.
Yeah, no, they move. They move fast. I mean, you know. Um, so in your case, if you're going guide, <coughs> what happens if you don't if you lose track of where they are? So, so Arash, you did some uh, initial sensitivity analysis of imaging errors, right? A <coughs> little bit, right? Yeah. It's it it it, it, it 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 it's on the long list of 127 things we have to do next, and, and, and it's up near the top, right? Because we know that imaging will be uh, imperfect and absolutely right. So so you know, if I had to say what is the next thing for that, the next thing is we want to get that working in experiments. That's what Alec and Barash and Arthur are working on right now. Once we get a working experiments, and we'll start push, putting tissue into those experiments. So instead of doing it in a petri dish, we'll do it in a you know a gel, and then we'll do it in a tissue slice, and then, and then you know we on 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 the other side, we're at the same time starting to do literally system identification of tissue. What is the magnetic drift in liver? What is the magnetic drift in brain? What is it? And and we're putting these pieces together, and and then I go to these magnetic drug conferences, and they're all working on you know. The, the, the 37th design for nanoparticle. I'm like, you know, we have enough nanoparticles. Do something else. So, 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 so yeah, so, so there's, there's, the, the, there's things that people are focusing on that is not necessarily the things that you need to be able to, 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 to treat patients better. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. So, <laughs> sorry, uh, you were writing down, if I don't remember right. Uh -huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. So, or perhaps some additional ingredients are present here. Uh huh. So why? Why first order? Oh, because the momentum is negligible. Huh? Because the momentum of the particles is negligible. So, 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 yeah. So you're really doing sort of Aristotelian. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no. In the high friction limit, right? Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I mean, th th those equations are, you know, well, they're. So. The, 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 they come from two things. They come from F equal to MA, and they come from conservation of mass. And you put those two things together, and you get the PDE. So now, going further, in, in addition to doing experiments like the U.S. spherical human uh -huh. problem or something, there you can write down those equations, but with modulation controls, right, of the field, the field vector fields. So, I mean, one should do appropriate nonlinear control therapy for that. Is it being done by your group? I mean, in the sense of various combinations of modulation signals for the eight. Uh, so, like, so like Lee bracket type stuff, what's controllable, what's not controllable? Yeah, that you know, that's, I've been, yes. And, and, and so we haven't gotten there yet. Um, so, 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 so w w when I first started this, I, I know how to answer the following. We sort of read up on this. I was reading... Um, Naveen Kanaja's stuff and, and, and the kind of things he does. Um, it was very, we could do the style of it, but not, but we couldn't take what he had exactly, right? So, so the style of it is, I can ask the following question. I can ask, if I have a distributed ferrofluid and I want to go in a certain direction, let me represent that direction by a weighting function, like a spatial weighting function, like a tent, for example. I can ask, is it possible for me to move this ferrofluid in this mode? Or is it possible for me to move this ferrofluid in this mode? And the way you do it is you form the integral that goes C towards W. You, you basically go the rate of change. And you project it onto, on, onto the weighting matrix. And then you get a quadratic form at the other end. And if a quadratic form is not negative definite, then there are some directions in which you can pick control to go in that direction. If it's negative definite, then you can't. That's the, that's the closest I've been able to come in terms of something that I can actually compute. So that, but, but we need to put way more brain cells into it. We actually took a step back, and we did the single blob control first. Because we, we just, that seemed like a good place to start. Now that we have that, and we have this other thing, now we need to bring those two things together. I still, this question of what's controllable and what's observable, it's a it's an open question, right? And it needs to be addressed exactly with sort of the sort of so, nonlinear lead type stuff, something. I want to be careful, though. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of actuation here. Right? If uh -huh. you focus on particle coordinates, it's just two variables, right? Uh, uh, and then on the other hand, you have lots of actuation. So, you know, in this case, what, what was that, eight? 
Wait, wait, so, so I missed it. If, if, if I only have two particles, you mean if I just have like two particles in, in there instead of like one particle, instead of having a billion particles? No, no. Just, so for the moment, if we were to think in terms of this blob story, uh -huh. I wasn't sure whether you meant the center of the blob with a single particle in it or really the whole shape of the particle blob is being controlled. What we, if that is, then I agree it's under-actuated. No, no, no. It, 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 it's over-actuated for the moment. It, it's, right. it's over actually. The, the, the way it's done right now, the, the way Arash did it right now, is there's a constraint on the center of mass, and we minimize the, cover, the trace of the covariance matrix. Yeah. That's, what, that's what is being done right now. Uh, it's continuous, but yeah, the magnets turn on. I mean, they, they, they take whatever values maximize that quadratic um, as a function of time. Yeah. So, at e so at each instant, we solve, we find the global optimum at each instant for that metric, which does not mean it's global over finite time horizon and does not mean it's global for a shape, but that's what we do. We could, we could, we could, we could do NPC. We could do lots of things. Yeah, could do lots of things. So, Reza, did you have a question? Maybe I can ask the next question. Okay. Uh, so, while back, very exciting. Thank you. Very exciting. While back, I had a discussion with a bunch of uh, microbiologists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and impacts that they don't know what mm -hmm. they are. And so I, I was wondering how much you're in tune with some of those studies at the NIH, and, and, and does it really matter down the line in some of these applications? And, and what type of materials of these nanoparticles will essentially be the defined? Yeah, so great question, big question. Um, so, 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 so we. These particles are starch and iron. So, so they're made out of things that, you know, so for example, iron gets injected into people as a contrast agent already, and, and starch is, 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 is in people also, right? So th this question of how safe are the particles really, it, it's one of the big elephants in the room, right? And so what we are trying to do is we want to commercialize the ear stuff. So we have to get the particles FDA approved, right? So our first step there is this place called the National Characterization Laboratory. It's between NIST and NIH. And we have gone to them. We have submitted a proposal to them that says, we have tested the efficacy and safety in animals and in human clinical trials for these magnetic nanoparticles made by Chemicel. Please, as an independent agency, evaluate our particles and tell us if they're safe. And so that, that's our answer. Um, so then the, the question of, are nanoparticles safe in general? Well, it depends whose nanoparticles, right? It, you know, it depends, it depends who made them. Uh, the chemist cell nanoparticles have been stuck in mice, rats, goats, sheep, pigs, and camels, and people. So, <laughs> so they've tried them in a lot, and, and they've been working on them for a while, um, and they're pretty good. <laughs>